after having presented the methods measuring the exchange of heat, we will clarify the relationship between heat and mechanical work. Generation of frictional heat is an everyday experience. For example rubbing our hands together makes us feel warm, cutting with a circular saw makes its blade hot, and we can also create fire by friction. These examples show the following simple fact. Whenever friction between the surfaces of two moving bodies occurs, heat is released from the bodies. If a force F is acting on a body such that it moves along a straight line covering the distance S on the surface of another body, then the work done on the body is given by the magnitude F of the force times the distance S. This mechanical work is equivalent to the change in the kinetic energy of the body, which we can measure in joule, that is in kilogram times meter per second squared. At the same time, the friction between the moving surfaces also produce the heat Q which we measure in calorie. Therefore a given amount of mechanical work not only increases the potential and kinetic energy of bodies, but also produces a given amount of heat. Conversely, the example of steam engine, which is an external combustion heat engine that performs mechanical work using steam as its working substance, shows that a given amount of heat can also be converted into mechanical work. The first apparatus demonstrating such a conversion between heat and work is the wind ball or pile in Greek, which is a stream reaction turbine. Its invention is usually attributed to Heron, a mathematician and engineer living in Alexandria, but it was Vitruvius, a Roman architect and military engineer the first who described an eolipile. The photo shows the reconstruction of the original apparatus, which was a hollow sphere mounted on a pair of hollow tubes so that it could turn on the tubes. The tubes were attached to a sealed cauldron filled with water which was placed over fire. As the water boiled, the hollow tubes provided steam to the sphere from the cauldron. The steam escaped from two bent outlet tubes on the equator of the ball pointing to opposite directions. As a result, the ball rotated about the axis passing through its mounting points, and converted heat into rotary motion. However, this solution was very inefficient at producing usable mechanical work, and the invention was never developed further into an engine applied in everyday life. In the second photo we can see a steam engine, which provided a more effective solution for the conversion of heat into mechanical work in the Industrial Revolution. The principal component of a steam engine is the cylinder with a moving piston, which is connected to a large flywheel. In the first half cycle of its operation, a high-pressure steam flowing into the cylinder pushes the piston out and rotates the flywheel. During the second half of the cycle, the flywheel moves the piston back and pushes the steam through an exhaust valve. Mechanical power is applied during only the first half of the cycle, and the flywheel keeps everything rotating during the second half of the cycle. Although with this solution, the efficiency of steam engines was still much lower than the efficiency of today's engines, their applications radically improved production processes in industry and started a new era in transportation. All these examples demonstrate that heat is a form of energy, and it can be interpreted as thermal energy. Then the conservation of heat, that is heat cannot be created or destroyed, corresponds to the law of conservation of energy. In fact, the idea that heat is a form of motion is older than the claim of the equivalence of heat and energy. It might date back to ancient times, and Francis Bacon also discussed it in his Novum Organum. The corpuscular theory of matter could help to explore the link between heat and motion as well. Boyle already provided corpuscular explanations for air pressure, and it was the Swiss mathematician and physicist Daniel Bernoulli, who formulated a quantitative kinetic theory of gases in his book Hydrodynamica published 1738. He interpreted gas pressure as the force exerted on a wall of the gas container due to the impacts of particles moving with a given speed in the container. Since the force of each impact is proportional to the momentum of the particles, Bernoulli also showed that pressure is proportional to the kinetic energy of the particles. As a result, his theory introduced the idea that heat or temperature could be identified with the kinetic energy of particles in an ideal gas. In 1760, Mikhail Lomonosov also raised the issue in the framework corpuscular theory, suggesting that motion can remain hidden in warm bodies due to the extremely small moving constituent particles of matter. However, another explanation of the phenomenon of heat became dominant after Richmond demonstrated the conservation of heat in 1747, which is known as the caloric theory of heat. In this theory heat was considered as some kind of substance, called calorecum, which cannot be created and destroyed. When Black introduced the concept of specific heat in the interpretation of his experiments performed in 1803, he also refuted the generally accepted claim that heat is proportional to the mass for bodies of equal volume, in other words, to their density. Black was convinced about that his measurements contradicted the kinetic theory of heat, which would imply that the more or the heavier the moving particles are in a body, the greater the amount of heat the body has. 
chemistry in that era also seemed to support the idea that heat is a substance. In his explanation of combustion, Lavoisier argued against phlogiston theory, which stated that a combustible substance such as charcoal burned loses weight when it is burned, due to the loss of its phlogiston component to the air. Lavoisier claimed that the phlogiston theory was inconsistent with his experimental results, and proposed a new explanation for combustion in terms of combination with oxygen rather than loss of phlogiston. In 1789, Lavoisier published a list of 32 chemical elements including oxygen, nitrogen and hydrogen. However, the list started with caloricum and he proposed the existence of the subtle fluid of heat, which could help to interpret variety of chemical reactions, like combustion. Caloricum was supposed to be an elastic liquid or fluidum composed by particles repelling each other. At the same time, the particles of the heat fluid are attracted by the particles of ordinary matter, depending on the physical properties and the state of matter. When this substance is present in matter, its particles create bonds with the matter particles which are similar to the chemical bonds. Caloricum can be neither created nor destroyed and it satisfies the conservation law, like ordinary fluids. Although the caloric theory of heat was popular, there was no universal agreement on the weight of the heat substance. Sir Benjamin Thompson, Count Rumford attempted to measure the weight of caloricum, and devised an experiment relying on the balance of equal masses with different heat capacities at a given temperature. In such a setup, different quantities of heat are responsible for equal changes in the temperature of the masses, and an imbalance should result if heat is a substance with mass. However, Rumford found that the amount of heat required to raise an about half a pound gold from the temperature of freezing water to red hot weighted less than a millionth part of the weight of the gold. The result of the measurement demonstrated that even if heat is a substance, it has a negligible weight. The caloric theory also assumed that friction must reduce the heat capacity of the body so that a given quantity of heat substance in the body can raise its temperature. Rumford wanted to examine this effect in the heat generation by friction, and he observed the process of boring cannon barrels. In 1792, he performed an experiment in which he immersed a cannon barrel in water, and used horses to turn specially blunted boring tool at a given rate inside the barrel. The illustration shows the various elements of the apparatus applied in the experiment with the cannon barrel, the boring tool and the container of water. He had observed that the mechanical friction between the tool and the barrel generated heat, which caused the water to boil within roughly two and a half hours. Rumford established that the amount of heat extracted from the barrel by friction is proportional to time, that is the supply of frictional heat was seemingly inexhaustible. He also confirmed that the specific heat of the shavings from the barrel remained the same, therefore heat could not release from the barrel as a consequence of the change in its heat capacity. Rumford argued that the seemingly indefinite generation of heat was incompatible with the caloric theory, and so was the fact that the specific heat of the shaving did not change. Then he concluded that one should consider heat not as a substance but as motion. Another important event buried the caloric theory forever. On a cold winter day in London in 1799, Sir Humphrey Davy, an English chemist showed that ice could be melted by rubbing two pieces of ice each other. Since he insulated the pieces of ice to prevent heat exchange between the ice and its surroundings, the heat substance could not flow into the pieces of ice from somewhere else. The heat developed by their mutual friction melt the ice and it could not arise from any decrease of specific heat in the pieces, because the specific heat of water is greater than that of ice. The only reasonable explanation was that heat was generated by friction, and Davy argued that the immediate cause of the phenomena of heat is motion. As already mentioned, the relationship between motion and heat and indicated that heat is a form of energy, and the conversion of energy into heat can be considered as a manifestation of the conversation of energy. The law of conversation of energy was postulated in 1842 by Julius Robert von Meyer, a physician and chemist, who claimed that energy can be neither created or destroyed. This important discovery was also formulated in the concept of mechanical equivalent of heat stating that energy and heat are mutually interchangeable, and the energy of a system can be changed by either doing work to the system or adding heat to the system. That is, a given amount of work generates the same amount of heat, provided the work done is totally converted to thermal energy. Therefore, the mechanical equivalent of heat is defined as the ratio of the mechanical work converted to heat, to the heat generated by the mechanical work, and it is often denoted by the letter A. We can see from this definition that the unit of the mechanical equivalent of heat is equal to joule divided by calorie. Meyer calculated the conversion factor between mechanical work and heat, although his result was somewhat different from its real value, due to the inaccurate data used in the calculation. One year later, James Joule could demonstrate this equivalence in his famous paddle wheel experiment, and determine the precise value of the mechanical equivalent of heat. First we present Joule's experiment, 
and then we show how Meyer derived the mechanical equivalent of heat. We start with the measurement of the mechanical equivalent of heat. James Prescott Joule, an English physicist established that various forms of energy can be converted into another, and in his paddle wheel experiment performed in 1843 he demonstrated that heat and mechanical work are both forms of energy by converting mechanical work into heat. The apparatus used in the experiment can be seen in the figure in the photo, in which a paddle wheel with a string wound around its axis was submerged in an insulated cylindrical vessel of water or mercury. A weight was attached to the other end of the string which was thrown over a pulley. In the experiment, Joule raised the weight to an appropriate height and dropped it. The falling weight pulled the string which caused the string to unwind and turn the paddle wheel. The rotating paddles passed through the gaps between a set of fixed veins in the vessel, producing maximum resistance to the fluid since the motion of the fluid is interfered by the veins. As a result, the friction between the paddles and the liquid generated heat and raised the temperature of the fluid in the insulated vessel. The weight fell at essentially constant velocity because the frictional force acting on the rotating paddles compensated the acceleration of the moving weight. Joule was able to measure the increasing temperature of the fluid within 1 over 200 of a degree Fahrenheit, which allowed a precise calculation of the heat generated by friction. He found that the increase in temperature was directly related to the amount of kinetic energy released to the fluid, indicating that an exact relationship governs the conversion of one form of energy into another. In this experiment, Joule could demonstrate that the mechanical work done by the gravitational field could be converted into heat, which was absorbed by the fluid. Since the mass of the weight, the height of the fall and the increase in temperature are given, the mechanical equivalent of heat could be computed as follows. The work W of the gravitational field is given by the product of the weight and the distance of the fall to the floor. If the mass of the weight is denoted by M and H is the distance covered by the falling weight, then the work W is equal to the mass M times the gravitational acceleration G times the height H. However, only the work reduced by the kinetic energy of the weight is converted to heat. Then the heat generated in the fluid is given by the mechanical work W minus the kinetic energy E kin of the weight. If we substitute the work W in the explicit expression of the kinetic energy into the reduced work, we obtain M times G times H, minus 1 over 2 times M times the square of its velocity V. Here we can factor out the mass M and we have M times the difference of G times H and V squared over 2. Since the insulated vessel was used as a constant pressure calorimeter in the experiment, the heat Q absorbed by the fluid is equal to the product of the heat capacity capital C of the calorimeter and the increase in the fluid temperature, denoted by delta T. The mechanical equivalent of heat given by the ratio of the reduced work W minus E kin to the heat Q, and A could be written as the ratio of the mass M of the weight to the heat capacity capital C times delta T, times the difference of gravitational acceleration G times the height H of the fall and the square of the height H divided by 2 times the square of the falling time T of the weight. Here we use the fact that the constant velocity V of the weight is given by the ratio of the height H to the measured time T of the fall. By applying this formula, a numerical relationship can be established between heat and mechanical work. For a given mass M, height H, heat capacity capital C and the measured increase delta T in temperature and the time T, Joule could determine the mechanical equivalent of heat. Although in his first measurements he could not yield the value that is considered correct today, with an improvement of the techniques applied in the experiment, he arrived at a value for the mechanical equivalent of heat that is very close to what is in use today. This value is 4.186 Joule per calorie. Nowadays there exist indirect but more precise methods for the measurement of the mechanical equivalent of heat, which use electricity. Now, let us examine how Meyer computed the mechanical equivalent of heat. His method determining its value was essentially the following. If we heat the gas in a container, for example in a cylinder with piston, while its volume is held constant by applying a force F on the piston compensating the increase of the gas pressure, the heat QV absorbed by the warming gas is given by the mass M of the gas, times its specific heat CV at constant volume, times the increase in its temperature denoted by delta T. This process is illustrated in the pressure versus volume diagram of the gas, where the initial pressure P1 is raised to the pressure P2, while its volume V1 remains constant. In the second case, we heat the gas in the cylinder at constant pressure where we let the expanding gas move the piston. The heat QP absorbed by the expanding gas is given by the mass M of the gas, times its specific heat CP at constant pressure, times the increased delta T in its temperature. This process is illustrated in the pressure versus volume diagram of the gas, where the initial volume V1 of the gas increases to the volume V2, while its pressure P1 remains constant. As the warming gas is expanding it does work on the piston, 
where the pressure expansion work W is equal to the pressure P of the gas, times the increase in the volume of the gas denoted by delta V. By comparing the two cases, we can see that the heat QP delivered to the gas at constant pressure is greater than the heat QV absorbed by the gas at constant volume. This surplus of heat is used to supply the pressure expansion work done by the gas, that is W is equal to QP minus QV. If we substitute the expressions obtain the heat QP and the heat QV, we obtain the difference of CP and CV, times the mass M, times the temperature difference delta T. The ideal gas law states that the product of the pressure P of the gas and its volume V is equal to the amount N of the gas measured in moles, times the universal gas constant R, times the gas temperature T. Therefore, the pressure expansion work, that is P times delta V, is equal to N times or times delta T. We can insert these results into the mechanic equivalent of heat defined as the ratio of the mechanical work W to the heat Q, which gives N times R times delta T, divided by M times the difference of CP and CV, times delta T. After simplifying this expression, we obtain N times R over M times the difference of CP and CV. Since the product of the mass M of the gas and its specific heat gives the heat capacity of the given amount of gas, we can write the mechanical equivalent of heat as the ratio of N times R to the difference of the heat capacities of the ideal gas measured at constant pressure and in constant volume. If the heat capacities are known, this expression can be used to determine the value of the mechanical equivalent of heat. If we multiply this equation by capital CP minus capital CV, we can see that A times the difference of capital CP and capital CV is equal to N times R. We can divide this equation of the amount of substance N, and introduce the molar heat capacity capital CM of the substance defined as its heat capacity C over the, the amount of substance N. Then we have the following equation. The mechanical equivalent of heat A times, the molar heat capacity capital CPM of the gas measured at constant pressure minus the molar heat capacity CVM of the gas measured in constant volume is equal to the universal gas constant R. Although we have measured heat in calories, we can follow the convention of measuring both heat and work in the same units, namely in joules. Then by definition, the mechanical equivalent of heat is equal to 1, and we obtain Meyer's relation stating that the molar heat capacity capital CPM of the ideal gas measured at constant pressure minus the molar heat capacity CVM of the ideal gas measured in constant volume is equal to the universal gas constant R. As already mentioned in the presentation of the ideal gas laws, the gas constant R in the right-hand side of the equation is equal to 8.314 joule per mole Kelvin.